since I'm here for you. And I'm here for you. <laughs> um, you know, Melissa says these words, um, space and kind of poetics, and kind of in this idea of a 21st century museum that also has the responsibility of history, right? So you, you're, you're trying, your goal, the, the charge was we need to celebrate history and culture and at the same time think about this thing that's supposed to look forward. How do you do that? Let's not, let's not ease into anything. Let's not ease in. <laughs> let's just go right in. No, I, I think that, um, that, that, that can be seen as the trauma or the challenge. And, yeah. and I, I was just really taken by um, the brief of this museum, because mm -hmm. I think that it's not often that this sort of brief appears um, in a generation to, to do this sort of work. Um, in a way, it, it, it became the lightning rod for clarifying a lot of things that I was exploring as an architect through the built environment, through different contexts and different um, conditions. But it, it allowed a consciousness to um, emerge around the narratives that I was already having, yeah. which were internal and really through the discourse of architecture. Mm -hmm. um, and using architecture as a kind of discourse to explore ideas is very much how I see my practice. Um, but I think it suddenly allowed a certain freedom. Yeah. You know, that, that, that it's, that it allowed a certain freedom to suddenly speak. So I think that architecture um, has always had a narrative, actually, until sort of modernism. And then you can, modernism has its own narrative. But the narrative became about a certain performativity. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think we've had an, an incredible 100 years where the generation would have been able to see the effects, like it or hate it and the sort of new world that we're sort of entering. So it, it felt to me like this was an opportunity to, to think about the power of narrative in architecture again. Yeah. Um, and, and, and to see if this was a, a, a moment to also finish certain stories that seemed to be implied in the architecture of the landscape, but not fully concluded or mm -hmm. not consciously concluded. Mm -hmm. So I think, in a way, that's the way in which I approach sure. it, and we can talk about it later yeah, yeah. As, we, as we go. But I think, yeah. That's beautiful. You know, I mean, it, it feels a little bit like um, there are times when a new museum is built, and the, the, the building itself is simply trying to be an interesting architectural building, and, it, and it's not necessarily directly connected to the content. When I look at the, the image of this building, the kind of, the, the image of architecture, the image of the city that your, your building represents, it feels like it's trying to embody s some, some things. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that embodiment? Because I think in that way, the building starts to function for me, the image, as a work of art. That, that before you get in and get into its content, it's already giving you uh, information about form and history, and can you talk a little bit about no, what I we think, see? I, I think that so. I think all the of all the places that I visit around the world. I mean, on, on every continent, almost there's a kind of there's a civilization that's kind of made an incredible um, sort of incredible architecture that we all love. Um, that represents and kind of makes a kind of represent, representation of their society and their place. And I think that actually, I think in the, 20, in, in the 20th century, we've sort of slightly forgotten that, mm -hmm. that idea of kind of making architecture represent where we are and what we're trying to say. And I think this building allowed a certain return to that conversation, because I, you know, I don't mean to, I mean to kind of make the work ground in, you know, architecture is a 10,000 year art. If we kind mm -hmm. of look at the beginning of, of the invention of a thing called the city, probably about 10,000 years ago, so it's a very old art, and it's kind of represented very old civilizations, but it's always been about the representation of a narrative. Yeah. And in a way, uh, I think we, the 20th century has kind of you know, made us think that it's architecture is just simply about function, yeah. and that this, the way, what it represents is, is a tougher thing, especially when we're talking about commerce or housing, you know, it's yeah. a, you know intangible experience. 
how do you, apart from defining shelter, you know, climate, et cetera, how do you kind of create those things? So, yeah. But I think that when you have something that has a kind of political and cultural power, yeah. it allows the narrative to start, and then the narrative can then inform other topologies very yeah. easily. So you know, in a way, it allows the narrative to have a, lang a, a voice, yeah. a loud voice. You know, uh, but I'm going to um, you, you talk. You, I'm going to ask you about you. Okay, okay. let me let me <laughs> well, tell you. Well, you have 45 minutes of I me. I still want to tell them one more thing about you. Uh, our our mics are not equal. Yeah. Can you can you can you turn mine down? Important issue. <laughs> Sorry, a little technical moment. Let's fix that. Yeah, we're still so. So, um, David was teaching at Harvard, and was teaching a class, kind of on the continent. Mm -hmm. Kind of thinking about architecture in the continent of Africa, kind of huge. And he had as his um, co-facilitators uh, Okwi and Waser and I. So it's me, David, and Okwi in Cambridge, right? <laughs> With like an all-white class of architects. <laughs> and they going back and forth to like Zimbabwe, they going to Harare, you know, you know thinking about Mozambique, you know, up in Johannesburg. And the assi <laughs> right, right? And the, and the assignment was actually a kind of simple brief. It was um, make housing in this context, right? And so, peop so people went around to neighborhoods that were in, in transition, places where things were about to explode in some positive way, uh, areas where they had been formerly uh, uh, um, underinvested shanty villages, shanty towns. And if you think the US has it bad, uh, if you've never spent time uh, in, in the townships uh, of South Africa, you haven't, you haven't really seen a certain kind of black poverty. You know? And so uh, these students went and bumped around the continent and then had the, the responsibility over a year to think about um, ports. That is like kind of what were the moments where Europe touched the continent and as a result there was a kind of transmission that happened. And then in the context of housing, how could a young architect at Harvard reflect on the need for varying kinds of housing uh, on the continent? And for several of the weeks, it was tough to, to try to get from one's orientation of the world to this other very, very different orientation. And I was, I was fascinated by the class, but I just wanted to mention that as this thing that feels like it sits adjacent to your architectural practice, which is the teaching of architecture. And I think sometimes when, when people get to this point, like in your career, uh, you wouldn't imagine how gifted and committed David is uh, to, to tr transmission, to making sure that, that there are people in the future to, ca to carry this field forward. And I just wanted to, for the museum and your commitment to education, uh, applaud you and salute you and say thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, in a way that, just to kind of reflect a little bit on that before turning it on to you a little bit. Um, the, the, the thought is that actually we, we, we've, got to, we've got to start, especially architects anyway, in a, in a world where I wouldn't even say I'm not using the term global, but in a, in a, in a context where the, the awareness of the planet is as we are more conscious of the sense of the planet than we've ever been. Architecture has to also have a kind of consciousness about the kind of difference. So in a way, you know, going into any school, um, apparently elite or not, and really talking about the idea of being able to kind of respond not just within your kind of political and social frame, but also to be able to kind of turn that intelligence that's in your mind into other places and to have that same intensity is really, is really the exercise. And mm -hmm. I think that that is the exercise of the architect of the 21st century, not to sort of try and invent fanciful forms, but to actually be able to find a kind of methodology to be able to engage anywhere in the world with the same intensity and focus. And how to do that is really a tough thing because there's the skills and then there's the kind of ability to read. And, yeah. and I think it's a kind of it's a very interesting discussion that's well, another one. Well, those two things, kind of fanciful form mm. 
and, and some sense of methodology or ideology or um, a constitution that governs what ones make beyond how flashy it could be. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like those things are intention. Mm -hmm. And when, when, I, when I think about people building museums, it seems like people want more and more something that's uh, going to light up the skyline, that's going to uh, uh, be, be more, more shiny and more glass and more modern and more than the next. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I don't hear very many t people talk about ideology, uh, you know, in relationship to to form, and so it's because I think that, that I think that conversation's been vacant, uh, or it's been vacated, and it's been sort of vacant, and I don't think there's much language about it. So there's, the, I think people have, people find it difficult to kind of go at what that is about, and I think the idea of commissioning an architect and telling and giving a brief beyond, you know. I need how many square feet mm -hmm. is still not really cognizant in our culture yeah. when it should be. I think there's, a, there's the cultural brief and then there's the programmatic brief. Yeah. And I think that at the moment we're really good at giving the, the programmatic brief, but we, don't, we sort of expect the architect to come up with the cultural brief. But in a way there needs to be a conversation about that. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that, that thing then feels like maybe where your interest in art and the humanities yeah and just an interest in people becomes really apparent because um, you know it, it feels like you're at the same time trying to answer the um, the structural responsibility the the commitment of architecture but you you also have to say to your client and your team people got to walk through this joint yeah. you know and, yeah. and and when they walk through this this place what yeah. you know and, and you know, I spend a lot of time talking to architects who work in affordable housing, and it feels like, like you said, square footage trumps a beauty or a livable experience, or the idea that someone who has a studio or one bedroom and is paying uh, an affordable housing rate don't want to see the trees outside. You know, and so and so it's kind of like extreme comfort and beauty is saved as an ideology for the wealthy. Mm. When in fact, it's the difference between this window and that window is really just profit, often. Yeah. Right. That, that's a beautiful segue. Right. <laughs> let's talk about what you've been doing in the South Side. And let's talk about the beginning of your practice. Let's talk about the inspiration. Sure. Why, does it, why do you choose art as a medium to do what you're doing? Because you studied as a planner. Yeah. So you're an urbanist, so you're somebody who understands the way the city's formed. Tell us how art mm -hmm. becomes the vehicle. Yeah, so, so in some ways it feels like um, urban, urban planning or whatever that is, or, or having trained, having, thinking a lot, taking a lot of classes in religion <laughs> or whatever, yeah. taking classes, yeah. that, that it felt like that was more about um, making the machine smarter than it was about declaring a vocation in life. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've never really felt like an urban planner, even though I got a degree in it. Mm -hmm. But I felt like thinking, of, learning to think about the city at the scale of the city mm -hmm. meant that as an artist, I immediately was born into a world where I wasn't just thinking about my art practice as my individual studio. That, it, that I was kind of hardwired from the beginning to imagine that the, the, the canvas scope was bigger, mm. right? And that, and that in some ways, I wish I had had the hard wiring of a, of a traditional studio practitioner. Mm. It would make my job a lot easier. <laughs> and, and in fact, if I were a New York artist, I might have an extremely, not only a tight studio, but I would also have the, uh, the precise burden of rent yeah. in, a, in, a, in, a, in a particular way. And so, so when you put square footage and rent together, a, a certain kind of output is necessary. Yeah. Let's say, let's yeah. say. That's a fact. That's a fact. <laughs> in Chicago, <laughs> nobody was gonna buy my art. Yeah. And there was, more, there was more space than people were interested in. 
and then I was born, think I, in my artistic practice, it was born thinking about something bigger and beyond the studio. And so it meant that I could kind of start anywhere. Mm. And so I just started with um, black space. Yeah. Right? And that in a way, from the beginning, whether it was thinking about the shoe shine uh, business, Shine King, that was going to be uh, uh, closed down because people didn't use it as much, and choosing to make an exhibition at the Whitney in 2010 mm. about shiny shoes mm. so that I could both drive new people to Shine King and publicly reflect on the fact that these small businesses were going away from black space. I feel like the shoe shine stand was a kind of clear work of art, but it was actually referencing this other thing in the real world, in the real city, in real black space mm. that was Mr. Cole and Shine King and these shiners who on a Sunday could make 350 to $500. Yeah. And that that felt like a real economy and something that um, dignified people would only, uh, who were who constantly going to a place to get their shoes shined, would never see the dignity in these shiners. Yes. I think this is, this is really powerful what you're saying, I think, and what, what behind what you're saying is even more re revelatory, I think, because in a way, you're almost, I mean, you're not almost, you're stating that, that the artist needs freedom to think, right? Yeah. And so, and so the, the question of how to start the practice is fundamental. Yes. Right? Yes. So you're saying, because in a way that is the baptism from which the work can then really have the clarity to understand its intention. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, right. it, it is reasonable to think that some artists, like some architects, rely on the periodical to determine yeah. Or, or art history books or architectural history books yeah. to determine what one's practice might be. Yeah. Like these are the things that went up ahead of me. Yeah. The, the, these, this is the meter. Yeah. But I think for me it was kind of like, and even with the black monks, is there a way to, before I start down the road of vocation or profession, can I start with belief and say, oh, well, these are the values that I have and, and these are the skill sets that I have. What do I want to do with those things together? And in some cases, it may create an opportunity where you just find yourself unexpectedly on a road uh, different. Okay. Right? So, so, you know, listening to the monks earlier, they were saying, like, well, you know, we don't sing songs exactly. Hmm. It's just kind of one long, one long thing. drone. Yeah. But in a way, th that, that becomes the, like, raw fodder by which songs might emerge. And so we're way more interested in the potential of the kind of possibility of a song than we are the song. Yeah. And, and so I love that kind of pre, that in art, you could stay in the, in the, in the, in the preview, mm -hmm. somebody was saying earlier, mm -hmm. rather, than, rather than imagining it as the finale, let's just practice. And so I feel like in a way I'm still at the beginning of, of practicing. Yeah, which is beautiful. I mean, in a way, so then does the work then, in a way, are you catching up with what the practice is telling you to do? As in, because in, in a way, you are one of those few artists that has an incredible repertoire um, right. of skills and abilities and, and range. Right. Um, and, you know, one could argue that that could be just methodical and mm. you, know, you choose to do it. But it, mm. I sense with you that it sort of evolves and you respond yep. and, it, and it becomes manifest as right. practice from throwing ceramic yeah. clay to, to doing chants yes. or, or to do incredible reconstructions right. of buildings. So this, this is also then maybe both ways uh, that what, what, what I think is happening is uh, I have the burden of uh, interest in a lot of things. And uh, if it were just about profession, let's say, then any number of smart advisors would say, choose one thing and make this narrative simpler, mm. right? So yeah. in your practice and yeah. mine, the complexity is, is uncomfortable. And when things are misunderstood, maybe a marketing person might say, if a thing is misunderstood, there's probably a greater chance that people won't come back to the thing or won't understand it or it'll be confusing be sending mis mixed messages, are yeah. you really a this or a that? 
are you really committed to this or that? Yeah. And so people want, a, uh, they want an outward brand, you know. A and, defined brand. Yeah. No. Right? And this makes me think of somebody like, like Leo Castelli. Like, look, yeah. these things are really working for you. Just keep doing that. Yeah. Right? Which also feels like the modernist moment. It is the modernist right? moment. Right? It's like, lean, be, lean, be few with your words, and lean with your ideological beliefs. Just shut up, in fact. And just <laughs> let Produce. the painting speak for you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And let, let the critics do speak, the writing. Do the writing. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that in this moment, for me, a kind of post, if there was a post moment, a post shut up moment. That's <laughs> it's a post structuralist world. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's so beautiful. <laughs> What you think about, I mean, you no, also run a complex shop. Very complex. And I, I have this, you know, this conversation every time I make a new building that it, every time I make a building, I insist that the building is not, you know, people ask, why does it not look like, you know, where is the kind of, where are the, where are the bits? Yeah. Where's the transfer? And I always say to my team, and, my, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's tough for architects because architecture, you kind of want to, you don't have time to prototype things, so you want to learn your skills, yeah. get your secret details, and then just kind of pump them out. You mm -hmm. know, like, okay, go to different cities and throw them out there, and, mm -hmm. and people recognize the image and say, oh, that's a this, that's a that. And I completely reject this way mm -hmm. of working, which is much more exhausting for the, for the presentation of what does he do. But, you know, it, I mean, it's taken me 20 years for people to start saying he's thinking about different places. Mm -hmm. But, like, that could never be the statement when I started working. I mean, just nobody wanted to accept that because the narrative of architecture was that you were going to be rehearsing this set of formulaic images that we could understand and then mm -hmm. pump them out. But well, every project is, is by its very nature has to be a, a kind of jettisoning and a beginning again mm -hmm. because each place is a different place and each context is a different context. Well, that, sound, like, that sounds like art. Right, like, like that should be architecture. Right, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that, that, that there's a way in which architecture gave something up. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't want to make any generalities no, no, about no. architecture, yeah, but, yeah. but you know what I'm saying? That there's a way in which but it those it signature it. moments mm. that an, an architect might have, where you're like, oh yeah, I, you know, I know who that is, or oh yeah, yeah I know who that is. Yeah, that those <laughs> those moments, you know, and when you talk about you know, it's almost like site specificity yeah. or kind of asking where does the, does the architect have the right to have internal inspiration and contextual inspiration that, that the next thing I make is going to be about the place that it is and not about me having a toolbox or a, a, a length of visual <laughs> vocabulary. Well, I think that brings, that brings in the, the really beautiful conversation about the notion of authorship. Yeah. yeah. And what, what is authorship? Is yeah. authorship an internal brooding um, abstraction mm -hmm. or is it a conversation with a kind of with with the substance of the planet and the place mm -hmm. that is not about words yeah is it is it is it a moment to kind of you know for me it is that moment when you you allow yourself to sort of inhabit the mm -hmm. the place and you don't return into your abstraction, mm -hmm. you know, it's yeah. it, as a way to kind of describe it. Sure. I know that sounds a bit esoteric, but no, I, no, it, it's, it, it's this idea of being present in a place. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it's reasonable that some people like travertine. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful and so material. They, they're like, look, my mm -hmm. buildings are going to be made out of travertine. It's a beautiful material. And others <laughs> start with a set of values. Yeah. And they're like, you know, I believe um, people should always be comfortable in my space, whether it's 2,000 feet, square feet, or 200,000 square feet. Yeah. And then, you know, in, in, in those value propositions, and I, I think about this a lot in art, um, when I'm making a work, I can't say that its bling effect is the thing that's on my mind. Mm. I feel like a lot of times when I'm making work, I, it's an extension of my diary, or, mm -hmm. you know, or an extension of, like, how, do, how can I make this set of ideals realized through this thing versus is the is the thing yeah. is that a generational thing maybe <laughs> not wanting to get all generational right <laughs> yeah you know, i mean but there's a, there's something in yeah. the air about this kind of desire to not um, to sort of somehow be i don't know if it's honest cuz I, I don't know what that quite means in that term mm -hmm. 
but somehow to have a certain relationship with the thing, yeah. rather than just to present onto. Yeah, you know. I, I want to. I, I talk about this story sometimes because it feels indicative. Um, Martin Puryear was invited to Chicago mm. to think about Du Sable, mm. and um, and he made an image of Du Sable, and it and it and the image didn't look black enough, mm -hmm. in a way. And when asked, what the image was, it was an abstraction. When asked, why isn't this image more black looking? Uh, Martin said, you hired an abstract paint, you know, sculptor, yeah. you know? <laughs> and I, I, can't make a, I, I can't make a figurative thing because I'm not from that camp, you know? And I don't know what DuSable looked like. Mm -hmm. And so an abstraction, is the best representation of this black man mm. that I might offer, mm. right? <laughs> right? And I, I feel like maybe your building, or sometimes one might expect of a black architect to embody what, what, what might be considered a black aesthetic. I mean, besides making a black building from time to time, which you've done. <laughs> You don't get no blacker than a black building. Yes. <laughs> Apparently, I'm, I'm, Apparently. Obsessed, I'm obsessed with dark buildings, yes. <laughs> but, you know, I think, um, did you feel heaviness on the um, aesthetic expectations of this building? I think this building probably more than, more than any sort of forced that sort of, that to sort of go to that place. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I I refused to. I was kind of, you know I'm always very interested in the, this dialectic of what seems ruse and sometimes very blatant, mm -hmm. and the the ability to to not underestimate what it does within civil society and public culture, um, and also um, the desire to kind of make make the language in the absence of a language. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so in a way, that, that dialectic is really always kind of oscillating in my work. And, and, and unlike an artist, I sort of feel like I have to sort of wrestle between um, that, that kind of grounding that's already there and where I would love the position to move. And the reason I'm interested in the position moving, moving is really just to expand the conversation. Because mm -hmm. in a sense, I feel like as an artist or as an architect, my job is to keep expanding yeah. the repertoire because only by expanding is, is one able to allow another generation or different um, um, artists or architects to find different trajectories. Because mm -hmm. in a way, we are, the, we are the people that open up the opportunities that open up other opportunities. Yeah. I mean, what's amazing about art and architecture is that the work is always coming from other work. Yes. We're always coming from other work. Um, and it is a kind of important part of what we all do. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the, uh, you use the word expanding, and it made me think about um, you being back and forth between um, New York, DC, and London, and the continent expanding. And then it makes me think about um, now that you've done these projects, now that you're doing these projects outside of London, how does London feel about your practice, <laughs> about kind of what happens when one expands beyond the boundaries of their home turf? And, that. Yeah. and then ain't a whole lot of room in London to expand. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm thinking about expansion like yeah. if they were excited about what you were doing, where you gonna build it? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just thought I'd throw at you kind of home yeah, and, that, and that expansion. Triangle. Yeah, but I, mean, I think that, that, that question also goes to you, so I, will, I want you to reflect on it whilst I'm thinking about it. Um, but, because you're, in a way, Chicago, the US, mm -hmm. Europe, and also now Africa is sort mm -hmm. of the world that you're operating in. But um, I, I think that the expansions have been, I mean, it's physically tough, but mentally so nourishing. Yeah. That's, the, that's the kind of dilemma of it. It's like this incredible 
fruit that you just want to keep biting at, yeah. right? Sure. <laughs> sure. But it's physically like punishing. Yeah. It sort of has this toll on you. Um, but I think that it's 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 for me allowed me to see London in a way that I didn't. You know, it's allowed me to kind of come out of my Londonness uh -huh. and to see my Londonness as something that I'm very conscious of yeah. in a way that. Was I was conscious of it before, but it's more conscious now in that sort of Du Boisian sense. Mm. You know, it's not just one, two, or three. There's maybe like you know, there's maybe twelve souls in my body right yeah. now. You know, yeah. <laughs> it just sort of keeps expanding. Yeah. You know, the the uh, it, which makes me think again about this word complexity. Mm. That in some ways. Um, you know, I, I sometimes talk about going going to Japan and, and spending time with these potters. Mm -hmm. And while I was there really trying to perfect the tea bowl, mm -hmm. you know, I wanted to have like, you know, I wanted to like my tokori, I wanted to have my guinomi, my chawan. <laughs> I wanted to like figure out the ways of tea. Yeah. And I remember one day there was this master potter and he was like, every two years I go to Biloxi, Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> you are from Biloxi, Mississippi. You Brilliant. know Biloxi, Mississippi. Brilliant. Why don't you make Mississippi pots? Yeah. Why you make Japanese pots? <laughs> you should be making Mississippi pots. I, I, we, <laughs> we, uh, I was we like, didn't you pay me to learn how to make a chow? <laughs> exactly. And it was this beautiful moment yeah. where it was actually yeah. Japan that was telling me to pay attention to Mississippi. I, I think we share Japan in common for this this um, slap. Yeah, um, you know, uh, yeah. And, so, and so in some ways, the complexity has a way of always bringing you back home. Exactly. Right, and that no matter how cosmopolitan I feel, when I smell uh, the musk of collard greens, <laughs> that kind of the take musk over of a house. Collard greens, I love it. You know, <laughs> you know, it takes over a house, and like the kitchen is hot, and then the house gets steamy, oh. and then the cornbread and the stove oh, been on all God. day, and it's like dank <laughs> collards. <laughs> it's you know, it, it like it does something to me. Yeah. You know, and it, it does something really wonderful. And if I'm in mixed company, you know, the deputy mayor of London, mm. you know, somebody, and and I'm I take my I take my mixed company, you know, into the dank house of collards. I think about my my Japanese sensei, and I think, you know what? My sister is masterful with collard greens. Exactly. My exactly. sister is a sense collard green sensei. Yeah. A living legend, sensei. I mean, God so. <laughs> you know, and and, and and you know, I think that in that way, what feels like an ever expanding, ever more complex situation, mm. also has a way of kind of just making you happy with your mom and dad and your sisters yeah. and the brother on the street. Like those things, you realize that it's the same everywhere. Yeah. That if a, if a brother ain't got a job he might be more bad than others. Hmm. If a sister doesn't have a job and her kids are in a particular way, it's gonna make her feel a certain way. And that those, those mental, the kind of mental care that we need and the job opportunities, the economic, all that social stuff that also is adjacent to our titles, that I think that there are these moments when I realize I would rather be, um, I would, I would rather be knowledgeable enough to know that wealth without family is dead, you know? And, and, and I would never want to trade up from the hand that I was dealt. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel like there's just a tremendous amount of richness in that, and, and that the only way that my art survives, really, is by choosing to stay in the thick exactly. of the hand that I was dealt. Exactly. It's kind of, you know, I think it's really, Japan is really interesting. Let's just, mm. just reflect on that a bit more. I, I kind of, I went to Japan for nearly two years. I mm -hmm. lived in Kyoto. Mm -hmm. And I was also, you know, obsessed with, you know, I studied Buddhist philosophy. I was 
painting. I wanted to learn how they painted. So I was learning brushwork. I was drawing. Yeah. And, um, and, and exactly the same kind of reflection sort of, sort of hit me in a, in a weird way be, to do with the built environment. Because you know, I sort of, in my childhood, had grew up, grown up in Africa. Mm -hmm. Born in Africa, grew up in Africa. You know, knew my father's village. Lucky enough, you know, I didn't even know that that was such a privilege. Yeah. But I know my father's village. I knew exactly where my great grandfather came from. You know, I know, you know, all this yeah. sort of stuff. And there's this, there's the farms, the okra plants that are in the fields. You know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I didn't think anything of it. I thought yeah. they were just things. And and in a way, it took going to Japan and sitting in a tea ceremony where, you know, or or sort of being in a tea house where you know you're talking to. A, sort of a tea master and they're talking about appreciating that the beauty of just that piece of paper that was torn and attached to that to that wall yeah. or the or the or the straw that has been darkened by you know 200 years of steam and smoke mm -hmm. um, to suddenly realize oh my god the very thing that you went halfway around the world to search for is actually also right yeah. next to you oh, yeah. and right with you with the people that are right next to you oh, yeah. and this idea of recalibrating your mind to understand the power of the context that's around you and the, the, the aesthetic richness but to have the consciousness to understand that it's yes. not necessarily outside yes. but inside I mean it allowed it profoundly changed the way I looked at the continent yeah and I think my whole consciousness about looking at Africa and rethinking what you know and reprogramming what people were saying to me about the continent and actually looking at it started yeah you know. I know that if I were to leave black soot on a fireplace, mm. my sister would be like, you are really nasty. <laughs> you know, yeah. we're in some places that char is like the only yeah. artistic element in the in room the whole thing. Yeah. is the char yeah. from, the, from the fire From burner, the fire. You know? Stunning. It was yeah. so great. Yeah. Well, I, I, actually, um, I actually want to leave a moment for two questions from the audience. Oh. And so... Um, I would hate to be so selfish. So, um, how are we doing time-wise? We have five minutes. Oh, there you go. That's three good. minutes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm on it. I got you. A question? Yes. First two words you said as a culture, culture, bearing. bearing. Right on. Thank you. Um, so performances happen, you know, in the world, and I could choose to meter my performance to a kind of mixed audience, and as a result, uh, that might feel like a compromise. Let's say, and so over the years. I've realized that the thing that I'm principally interested in is ensuring that these songs that my mother sang, that people don't forget them. Or ensuring that these, these craft things that I know how to do, that they're not forgotten. And that, that the public performance or the record of the public performance becomes a way of kind of sealing a deal that shine on me, mm, shine. Y'all recording? Oh. <laughs> and that, and that, that thing uh, means that, that uh, I think mom is pleased, but also that I'm having a, it, it is actually requiring a courage to do this thing in mixed company. And also at the same time that I am in a crossroads of what these songs mean for me in terms of spiritual value and where they live, the choice to understand the value of them despite my questions feels like a kind of commitment to their preservation. And so I actually feel like I'm engaged in something that's like a historic preservation at the same time that I'm trying to deliver the song to Joan Mitchell, deliver it to Clifford Still, deliver it to Irwin, deliver it uh, uh, to, to Abrina, uh, Marina Abramovich. That, which, and those, those moments of, um, the black spiritual meeting art history, meeting uh, a, a kind of uh, the monastic in improvisation feels like a good m mix. Yeah. 
Please. Last question. Hi. Uh, being of African descent mm -hmm. and designing a museum that's African American, and I'm just wondering how you felt about because there's a separation between these two cultures because we were taken from Africa, brought to this new continent, and often don't have that connection with our African roots. So I think it's really important that an African design that museum to bring those two cultures kind of back together. And I was just wondering how you felt about that in, in terms of uh, helping this divide that exists between us forming some sort of unity between that. Wow. Wow. Um, I didn't have to ask the hard question. <laughs> That's, That's my point. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you for the, no, thank you. It's, thank you for the beautiful question. Um, I think that when, I'm, I'm assuming that that board that looked at the project sensed what you're probably saying. Um, I didn't, consciously go into it thinking that, but it became clear that, that in a way the building, you know, you realize that a lot of the labor and a lot of the architecture of African Americans were for others. It was very rarely for them. So this notion of actually being able to, you know, create, the, even, even, even the, the sort of the sanctity of a, you know, a, the, the, the shack from, from the labor of slavery was constructed under a narrative that wasn't theirs. So there's something that was profoundly um, silent, um, that was very, very much the sadness of the thing, mm -hmm. in a way, that for me, the privilege of, the, of realizing that I had so many, I could connect through modernity, through to a village, in the middle of a, you know, the uh, Prepre Hills in, in Ghana, suddenly made me realize that I had this perspective that could start to maybe, um, yeah, start to make some stitching. And in a way, I think what became very interesting to me was this, was this idea that this is actually not separation. That's a mental construction. There isn't a separation. It's actually the, um, and in a way, what I, what I hope that the building is trying to do is almost like a kind of, you know, a sort of like a Greek story. I'm sort of trying to put little markers to make the connections. Do you know what I mean? So for me, and that's what I mean by the kind of consciousness of the project, that it forced a consciousness, which I was doing as an artist, create, you know, yeah. trying to do this thing. But I kind of realized that, and for me, that evidence was even on the mall. <laughs> that was what was really profoundly, because I looked at the mall, and when, when I looked, at the, looked through the lens of my eyes at the mall, I saw the kind of unfolding history of, you know, at least 5,000 years of history that went from Africa to Europe and America. So, yeah. you know, um, and so I remember the first few m moments of thinking about it, I was saying, look, well, here's the obelisk of Karnak, and here's the dome of Florence. Yeah. The story's played out right here, but most people don't even know what it is. <laughs> so I was like, and you know, the narratives that people kind of have around the mall makes you think that it's a kind of singularity from one particular moment of the classical language. And I was like, actually, it's so profoundly not. Yeah. So in a way, for me, it just felt incumbent to sort of, you know, between these two things, really start to make, make, make the stitching. But also, it comes down to even this building, even. I mean, look, forget you know, just for a second. This idea of what what this place is, what um, the contribution of Africa is to the world generally, in terms of I think the last 500 years, um, the contribution of uh, the DNA of 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 the sort of first Africans who came here, who've made the African American community, who are now here, and the way in which all these things are all interconnected, it was profoundly important to sort of somehow yeah, have in this building. And, and it, it, I don't know, maybe I just felt that I could visibly see the, yeah. the threads. Well, so yeah. I just wanted to put them in there. It was just creatively, just I couldn't even, I, can't, I couldn't stop it.
Well, David, we're excited. Just, I mean, we're excited to be present and, you know, when we can get our ticket, when we can get in. <laughs> That's a different conversation. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, David Ajay. Yeah, that's the game. <laughs>